Welcome back to another episode of the Vet Worthwhile Podcast. I am James Yost, Partner and Wealth Advisor at Signature FD, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Travis York, owner of 3-1 Advisors. Travis, how are you? I'm doing great today, James. How about yourself? I'm doing well. I am super excited today to uh, have the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with two industry icons, Dr. Peter Weinstein and Dr. Donna Harris. Um, I think in my time in, in the veterinary profession, I certainly have not seen or spent time with two people who care more and, and are more interested in, in building back and building a great profession. So I, I guess maybe maybe my place that I'd like to start is with Donna and, and Peter just telling a little bit about, about themselves and, and sharing their story in veterinary medicine. So Donna, I'll, I'll throw it over to you first. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you both for, for having Peter and I. We've known each other for a long time, so it's kind of fun. So I went to Michigan State University for both undergraduate and veterinary school, graduated and went into kind of a combination of zoo medicines, small animal exotic medicine, but decided there was a different path I wanted to take. So I worked on my MBA and uh, eventually I moved from Indiana to back to Michigan because I originally started in Indiana. And then started doing some economic research. So this will show my age. This was back when the mega study was released. And there was a lot of economic research going on through the NCVEI. Wow. Kind of got pulled a little bit into Michigan State doing some of their research with them. And then more recently uh, finished an online master's with the University of Houston in strategic foresight, which is looking at future trends and what's going on in the world out there to see how it's going to affect uh, various businesses, in my case, looking at how it's going to affect veterinary medicine. And so now wow. I teach the business side of veterinary medicine and try to instill a little strategic foresight into the students. Very, very exciting and interesting. And I, I mean, I think that's one thing, Donna, that you've always had a, a ton of passion around just the students and 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 the future of the profession for 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 those students, which is something that I, I really appreciate. And Peter, I, I know you uh, have a lot of passion around the students, but you know, also a lot of interest in in business models and you know, sharing your story around around the the business models that you've seen in veterinary medicine and all the different hats you've worn, I think would be some great insight for our listeners. I sit here humbled by Donna's history. And, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, am, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm a Cornell undergraduate, Illinois vet school. And two weeks after graduation, I decided I would choose when I was cold again and moved to Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> where I have been ever since. I worked as an associate for a few years before doing a startup. After running the startup for a few years, I realized how little I actually knew and that I was really guessing about how to run a business based upon watching some practices that I've worked in. So while running my business full time, I went back to school at night to get my MBA, which I accomplished over two years. And uh, it was more of a focus on small business and entrepreneurial MBA. So it was very useful and practical in my practice, made a lot of changes, moved, expanded, and eventually sold to a corporate consolidator very early on in my career because I really saw a need and a desire to institute change in the profession. I became involved with the students, I would suggest probably the first time was it in in 2000 or 2001, I think it was January 2001, at what was called the School to Success Symposium held at the University of Pennsylvania. I was one of the speakers there, and it was put together by the students at, at Penn to help provide them with some education on economics and business. And from that event, the VBMA was started. And from that event was a number of other speaking engagements at veterinary schools across the country. So I became involved with uh, speaking very frequently at VBMAs and focusing on uh, students and, and education kind of in a peripheral fashion. In the meantime, I was doing consulting. I, I worked for a couple of years at what was then Veterinary Pet Insurance is now nationwide running their claims department. I have been very, very involved with organized veterinary medicine at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level. 
was the executive director for the Southern California VMA for 14 years. I was the chair uh, of the Veterinary Economic Strategy Committee of the AVMA for three years. And then in uh, October, or excuse me, August of last year, I started teaching the business and finance class at Western University of Health Sciences College of Veterinary Medicine in Pomona. So I have now become integrated and integral to the education of the students at the veterinary school there while continuing to speak at the VBMAs from that standpoint. So I have a lot of passion for the students. I have a, a, a significant financial investment in uh, veterinary students, as I have a daughter who is a fourth year veterinary <laughs> student at Oregon State <laughs> University. Um, so I feel the pain. Peter, um, is that is that investment in students or just an investment in the profession being successful going forward? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I think I've got that level of commitment to helping set the next generation and and get us out of the rut we've been in since Noah and try to find a new path that meets the needs of the changing generations that we're in, in, in terms of education models and business models, et cetera. Wow. That is uh, super helpful and interesting. And, you know, today's topic is the future of veterinary business, but I don't think we can really go forward until we start to look back. And so I just had a quick story. I was with a client a few weeks ago, he and his wife, when they first opened up their clinic in the Chattanooga area, they were the 31st and 32nd veterinarian in the city. Uh, now there's well over 300 veterinarians in the city. Also, I mean, they started as a hybrid, a small and large animal hospital. And when they first started, their income was $24,000 a year if they were lucky. Uh, so interested to get y'all's take on that. First with you, Donna, uh, you mentioned being a futurist and working with students a ton. So we would love for you to share a little bit about how the business of veterinary medicine has evolved from the student perspective over time. Well, that's certainly an interesting perspective when you think about it. And and I I try to um, bring futurist thinking into the students at a real basic level. And, you know, futurism and, and a futurist, it sounds really sci-fi and everything, but it's not... It, it's not always scientific and it's very much not predictive. So a futurist does not predict the future in any way. A futurist looks at the changes that are going on in five key areas and how that's going to um, affect and the, the, the business. And that's what I try to bring into the students. But if we, if we circle back to what their students, when I first started, even on the fringes of academia, really the business education was based on the assumption that they were going to become business owners. And that was what the majority of them were going to do. Whereas now, in the in the years, I would say 12, 15 years, we focus on making them day one ready associates. And that, yes, there are options through VBMA, through electives, through elective rotations for them to get ownership type education we want them all to graduate with an, what, we, what we at Michigan State consider an associate level of understanding of business. So do they understand the importance of marketing, of operations, of finance? But could they, with that, with that basic understanding, could they own their own business? Probably not. They need a little more education with that. And those students gravitate toward the elective type opportunities. And that's certainly the big shift that I've seen in education as far as the business side. And of course, just the idea, when we think about business in academia now, we we title these professional skills as opposed to clinical skills. And we, when we think about the professional skills category, that's got everything in it from professionalism, well-being, a suicide awareness as a part of well-being, resilience, Communication can be in there as well, and morphing all the way over to personal finance and the financial management and operations of a, of a practice, right? Even though some of our students aren't going to be in practice, they still need to understand the basics of business. So we, you know, your title of this is the future of veterinary business in academia. We think of business as in that professional skills category. 
Mm. Very, very interesting, John. I just kind of one follow up on that is, I know you said previously, you know, the, the schools were focused on bringing veterinarians along to actually be business owners. And now it's more really focused on helping them become associates. Is that because the student's mindset has changed and the veterinary students are less interested in that and there's less motivation to become owners? Or is that because that's what the need is in in the profession? And what's the kind of the softer side of it? Do you think the students want to be owners today when they come out of school? I think there's, it's a, as always, Travis, it is a, it's a complex set, right? Hmm. So number one, the curriculum is packed, right? It It is absolutely packed and continues to be packed. And at, at what point do you continue to educate a student to become a practice owner when the reality is that the majority of them will no longer be practice owners? Now, that doesn't mean we don't give them the opportunity, like I said, through the elective and I can only speak to an N of two. I teach at two different veterinary schools, right? So I can't, you know, Peter can speak to what some other schools, I, I do know what other schools does because there's a, a group of us that communicate on a regular basis across all the veterinary schools on this, these professional skills topics. So not to get sidetracked at all, but there, there are less opportunities for students to become practice owners. There are there are, is a decreased percentage of students that want to become practice owners, but I say that with air quotes around or an asterisk because many of them have not have they they haven't come up through the profession with ownership as an option. So they've come up through the profession as a high school person who worked as a kennel kid, and all they've been exposed to is a practice that was owned by either a large corporation or a large group of owners. It wasn't an individually owned practice. So they may come into the school without the knowledge, hey, wait a minute, I could own my own practice. I could start my own practice. So we certainly talk about it to the general population. And we certainly try to encourage that through a number of activities. But they have to take that initial step themselves if they have that driving desire to take some of these more elective opportunities to get the real business training. And, you know, the truth is if they, if they come out of veterinary school and they're associate minded, that's okay because there's lots of opportunities in the continuing education world for them to get that extra knowledge. I know Peter's a speaker in many conferences. They can go to some of Peter's talks and they can say, okay, wait a minute. This is how I start my own business. This is So there's plenty of opportunity later should they decide to do that. So it's kind of a long-winded answer to your question, but it's, it's a really complicated thing in academia mm-hmm. to, to offer everything to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think obviously one thing that, that you touched on is it's a smaller percentage of students that have interest in, in ownership. So, Peter, I'd love to get your perspective. Obviously, you've spent a lot of, of your professional career focused on helping ownerships through your book, The E-Myth Veterinarian. Do you feel like in your work, Peter, that the veterinarians that are becoming owners and looking for that ownership opportunity are more prepared, seek out the resources, and better equipped to um, be an entrepreneur before they start, or are they still kind of doing what you did as an entrepreneur, which is uh, learn as as you go? It's a great question, and, and I appreciate Donna's insights. I did a, a non scientific scientific study of the current third years at Western when I started teaching this fall. More than half the students, of course, that was one more than half the students, are interested in hospital ownership. So. The way the course is set up that I teach, the first portion of it is focused on them and developing an understanding of personal business skills. And the second portion is understanding the business of veterinary medicine. As a non-traditional academic, in other words, I'm only 20% academic uh, when it comes down to being on faculty. I um, see things in a different fashion and and I debate consistently with the dean and as well as many of the faculty members that that the veterinary schools are great at producing great veterinary students, 
but maybe not producing great future veterinarians in clinical practice. I do think that the course, at least the way I'm focusing on it, is, is that I start with day one telling the students that each of them owns their own small business. And that small business is you incorporated because each of them needs to learn how to run themselves as a small business successfully if they even want to consider running a small business with one, two, 10, 20, 40 doctors. So I think the basic understanding of finance, accounting, law, human resources, people starts internally with each of them individually, and then they can expand. And if they want to just expand and be an associate, that's wonderful. There's plenty of opportunities there, but they really need to understand themselves. So I, I think where we have come, thinking back to when I was in veterinary school in the dark ages, it really was in the dark ages because we had one elective in business. It was taught on VHS. Travis James, do you know what a VHS is? <laughs> I, I do. Very I do. familiar, but haven't seen one in quite some time. Yeah. I mean, I mean you can find them at, at flea markets um, <laughs> and swap meets. But it was taught, taught by uh, by VHS with the, in black and white with the guy sitting behind a desk lecturing to whomever wanted to sit in the basement of the large animal clinic on a Friday afternoon and get some business knowledge. It has become more and more integrated and integral in the curriculum. Part of that is because the COE, the Council of Education, has identified the need. And I think all of that tends to be a response to the fact that veterinary medicine has moved into a $33 billion industry, the small animal side, and probably an even more significant on food animal, that we need to do a better job of being advocates and caretakers of. And so we have to look at this as a, I like to say that veterinary medicine is a health, is a service industry that provides healthcare versus a healthcare industry looking to provide service. And so I think that's where the, the mindset has to be going forward is, is how do we provide a service with a value proposition at all levels? I don't care what type of veterinary medicine you're in. And it, it, it starts by teaching the students about the fact that veterinary medicine is really a business and you have to understand that. Wow. Yeah, that's some pretty uh, pretty profound stuff and, and very helpful in shaping that, that part of the business. So I've only been, I've been going to take pets to veterinarians for almost two decades, but don't have near the experience or accreditation that that you and Donna bring to the table. So definitely interested in hearing y'all's perspectives on a few other topics. One of the things that Travis and I talk about all the time and you know we're more involved in on a day-to-day -day basis is the activity around the consolidation that's taken place. So we'd love to hear from y'all. I guess we'll start with Donna on how the consolidation of, of veterinary hospitals has impacted your teaching at the veterinary schools. Um, I I can honestly say that I don't believe that the consolidation has impacted the teaching at all. I've certainly seen a shift in the students' attitude toward consolidation, which I think is fine, right? I mean, when it was starting, they were reflecting the attitude of the practitioners to whom they worked with in their pre-veterinary days, and they would come into school saying it was terrible, it was horrible, it was awful. And that was, you know, 15 years ago. And now it isn't brought up at all. Mm. It's just the way the industry is. Some students see it as negative when we talk about it. Some su students see it as positive. And we talk about the negatives and the positives about it. So from a veterinary student perspective or the school and how the school has managed, it's not, at least in my, in my world, it has not impacted the actual teaching of the veterinary students. Now, in my specific classes, I absolutely want them to understand the different types of ownerships. Yeah. I want them to be aware, but it's not presented in neither a negative nor a positive. That is for them to determine. Yeah. And of course, we see the reflection of the, the salaries, but that's only been a, 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 recent, a, a recent change. Yeah, and that that's fair. Peter, what about you? What's been the what's been the impact for veterinarians that are practicing hospital owners 
And I mean, big picture is, do, do you feel that the, the profession is evolving for the better? I know we'll talk about the future, but, you know, looking back. Well, let me just start by saying any evolution is, is better if you want the species to survive. Okay. If you don't want the species to survive, then evolution becomes mutation. And that's a whole nother discussion. So we have to evolve. We have to evolve because it's the only way that we can move forward as a profession. 1993, I had a lunch with uh, Art Anton, and then I met with Bob Anton and Neil Tauber from VCA. And we were talking about the integration of corporate-owned practices into the veterinary profession. I was uh, just done with my MBA, and I said, you know, I think what you're doing is, is going to bring some great opportunities down the road, but I think what the shortfall is, is that we have a lot of veterinarians who don't understand what your plan is. And, and all they do is see it as big business becoming involved with the mom and pop industry. And so I suggested to them that they hire me to translate corporate work, corporate speak into veterinary speak, and they didn't hire me. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> Nice try, though, Peter. I mean, so, so, the, so the one life lesson there is, is like if somebody tells you no, it doesn't mean give up. No, it just means you work against them. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> cut that, cut that. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. We're going to keep No, that. well, from all transparency, I sold to a corporation. So I've seen it as a seller. I've seen it uh, as a consultant to industry and some of the work that I've done. And when it comes down to the students, many of them, all of them, have grown up in an industry that has been um, involved with corporate ownership. It's not like Donna and I, when we came out of school and there was no such thing as a corporation. So they've grown up in that, that business model uh, from that standpoint. And, and many of them have been through transitions when a practice sold from a, an individual to a corporation. So they bring their own mindset in. They also bring the mindset of what they read and hear. One of the homework assignments I gave last year was to do a group project. It could be a debate. It could be, an, it could be anything they wanted. And there was an excellent debate about the pros and cons of corporate ownership. So I, I do think that there is a place for it. I do think, as Donna said, we need to educate the future generation of the different business models that do exist. That includes S Corp, C Corps, LLCs, LLPs, all of the different things that are out there, as well as corporate ownership and the pros and the cons of all of them from a personal and a tax and all of the different benefits that go along with it. Um, I think what we have to do is give people the opportunity to make choices. Um, I coach a lot of veterinary students as to their first jobs and making that decision. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with lifestyle and, and what they're looking for. So I do believe that there is a place for corporate ownership in the veterinary profession. But I also strongly believe that we need to continue to have a very significant role of independent ownership and setting the role going forward of independent owners. And we as educators and we as those involved with the profession need to continue to identify and coach and cajole young doctors to be hospital owners and help, help set the, the pathway for independent hospital owners down the road as well. I think there's a there will be a happy medium somewhere down the road, I'll let the futurists decide when, um, <laughs> that, uh, that independent practices and um, corporate practices will, will find that equilibrium that's optimal for the evolution of the veterinary profession. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting point that I want to I want to dive off of that a little bit more. So, you know, I mean, there's an equilibrium that we're going to find. And, you know, through Donna's skill, she'll probably tell us the exact date and hour that that will happen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, that's right. You know, in, in the process of getting there, the independent ownership, you know, Peter, you said it, right? Like businesses continue to evolve. The models continue to evolve. Oftentimes that evolution doesn't happen inside of organ bigger organizations. It happens at an independent or, you know, an individual level where, you know, somebody comes up with a new idea or a new way to, to deliver that service. So along the veins of, you know, veterinary medicine 
is a service business delivering healthcare. Love to get your perspectives on what those business models are going to look like. And if somebody wanted to be innovative in their business model, what might be some good things to think about? So, you know, whoever wants to dive in and take it first, or, you know, I'd even love it if you guys went back and forth a little bit on your uh, what sounds good and what doesn't. Well, I've gone first a number of times. So let's give Peter a stab at it and then I'll tell him how he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Great. <laughs> I'm used to I'm I'm used to being told I'm wrong, but that's good because at least I'm I'm starting a conversation. What do I want to see in the future? I think that we need to look at the fact that we have a huge diversity of pet owners, from the extremely rich like Travis and James to the um, <laughs> yeah. the, yes. more, the more financially challenged like Donna and myself. But <laughs> we have to try to find some business models that make veterinary medicine affordable. For those people who are living as close to the poverty line as they can live because they still love their pets Mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that those veterinarians can also make enough money to have a lifestyle to which they become uh, accustomed i do think that we are a service industry and i think that let me just get get into some specifics four things number one we have to have start being, building business models that are more team-based in the delivery of veterinary services. It can't be as doctor-centric. Number two, it has to be client-centric. It has to be a, an experience for clients that they want to keep coming back, like an Uber, like a Starbucks. Number three, we need to integrate high-tech and high-touch to make our practices access to technology without, without losing the relationships that we've built over time. And probably the more significant change, most significant change, is I think the veterinary business model is way too complex, and we need to find ways to simplify it and thus increase and enhance our profitability. Wait, so I I think I may be hearing something. You're not a fan of one business, one hospital serves all different types of, of clients? I am thinking more and more of we need like the six levels of Marriott or Hilton for veterinary clients. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we need to start to look at that because what happens is we try to be a jack of all trades and we make become a master of none and we make nobody happy. We've spent, and I did it, and, and I'm sure Donna dealt with this in clinical practice as well. You try to make your clients happy and the next client you can't make happy as well. So why can't we try to find a vision that allows us to meet the needs of the clients at the vision that we want to deliver in our practices? So no, I'm I'm not a big advocate of, of trying to continue to be a jack of all trades. I just don't think we can do it any longer, at least in the urban suburban sprawls that we've got. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think, you know, one of the, the stories that I always tell is, you know, my dad's first hospital, he took a loan for $200,000 to start that hospital in 1981. The first loan I made to a veterinarian to start a hospital was in 2001. That was for $250,000. They, you know, both hospitals were equipped very similarly. Today, you can't start a hospital for less than than $700,000 if you equip it appropriately, and it may push closer to $800,000 or or $900,000. So, Donna, you know, if, if, you can do a $200,000 hospital, you can then provide service to maybe a, a, you know, a client base that can't afford a $750 veterinary visit. Do you have any thoughts as a, what that may look like in the future and, and how somebody may go about, you know, delivering service to somebody who needs their, their veterinary visit to be a $150 experience? Yeah, I agree with that. I, it, it hurts to say this that I agree with Peter on a lot of the things that he he said, but but one of the things that I want to pull out of that is he talked about you know taking advantage of technology to make high touch high tech practices, and the the difficulty with that is that often flies in the face of making an acceptable spectrum of care, and that's the that's the words we need to start thinking about and using in the profession is what is an acceptable spectrum of care. Because for so long, we've pushed this gold standard, gold standard. But unfortunately, the society around us has become very segmented in their ability or their willingness, not just ability, but willingness to pay for certain services for animal care, whether it's large or small. 
And what is an acceptable spectrum of care to provide those services for that client? So one of the things to think about is, are we pricing our services? Of of course, we can always price them higher. But when we do that, how many dogs now are, for example, aren't even coming in because they're limping. So they're running around their backyards with a mm. ruptured ACL or, or, and they're not even coming in, let alone getting any sort of repair. So when we price our services, because I'm kind of rambling here, but my, my difficulty is if we price our services and if we suggest that the only thing to do with certain illnesses is this one particular type of treatment, then we're preventing certain clients because of willingness or ability to even come into the hospital. So I wanted to kind of hone in. Peter brought that up. When we look at the future of veterinary medicine, we have to think about how can we embrace that high touch, high tech that he mentioned, but also honor the spectrum of care that clients not only can't afford, but are willing to afford. Because some of our well-off clients are not willing to afford some of the things that we believe that that animal deserves to have. And we, we've got to figure out how we can bridge that in the future in our practices. Donna, can yeah. I jump in for a sec? Because sure. when I was talking about high tech, I really wasn't talking about the clinical delivery of high tech. I was talking about simplifying access through online portals to make appointments, to online ability to, to um, refill prescriptions, to simplify and, and making access and less less need for staff from that standpoint. So yeah, the, the clinical stuff increases the cost of care, but maybe if we can use technology to simplify the staffing models and other things, we can bring down the cost of care from that standpoint as well. This discussion of access to care and spectrum of care is, is huge, having just had my dog excruciate repaired from that standpoint. <laughs> yeah, you can feel that pain then, can't you? I can. Mm. You know, and the, and the one thing that, you know, you brought up, Peter, that I think is such a valid point is tying. Uh, we think about the hotel business and the hotel business is effectively a service business. And then you reference the Marriott. And so I want to use this to, to transition, really dig deep into business models and what business models make sense. Because it, when you start to think about, you know, the hotel business, if I go to the Econo Lodge and I pay, $67 a night, I'm fully willing to get a different level of service than if I go to the Ritz and I pay $670 a night. If I go to the Ritz and I get an econolog experience, I'm vastly disappointed. It's impossible to provide a Ritz level experience at an econolog price. And so what I would you know, maybe ask is, I'll just kind of go this direction. Donna, can you outline for me what you think, you know, if somebody is is the business model that works, if you're looking to service a, a client who is looking for that service level that is more in, in line with a, a limited service hotel, how does that look in veterinary medicine? Well, there's a couple of things that are promising. There's a couple of schools right now that are starting masters of veterinary medicine, a mid-level practitioner. And right now we're looking at a couple schools that have started this and it's for our already credentialed veterinary technicians. And so, of course, when we think about a mid-level practitioner, we jump to the PA and nurse practitioner models in human medicine. And I think this is a real promising step for veterinary medicine. It was first talked about back in the nineties. And I know that, but now might be a better time for this. And the programs are already starting. Some States, may have to look at their practice acts. Other states do not because every state's practice act is different on what these mid-level practitioners can do. And and really it can, it has the ability to shape, to completely reshape our delivery. And if you think about human medicine, it has reshaped our delivery. And the difference is that in human medicine, a nurse practitioner and a PA uh, because of third-party pay system, there the practices are reimbursed at a different level. So no, we don't have third-party payment in veterinary medicine. So could using this mid-level practitioner for 
rechecks, uh, continuing care on any sort of longstanding problem, urgent care triage or emergency care triage, and then the client perhaps paying less for using the services of a mid-level practitioner. Now, there are some things that need to happen for this to work. And primarily, it means the veterinarians have to let go of this control that they believe that the only way to do it is for a veterinary to do it, right? For a veterinarian. And so we have to build a different mindset within our veterinarians. And some of that is just a, a change in, in understanding that a, a mid-level trained professional veterinarian a technician can deliver just as good of medicine on these certain cases like most of us have seen a nurse practitioner or a PA do that. And I think this model of using that can, can be a, make a big difference in our spectrum of care, access to care issues, in our uh, work, floor, uh, work shortage with employees. I, I think it shows real promise. Thanks again for tuning in to the Vet Worthwhile podcast. You can find us online at signaturefd.com slash signature veterinary. And then our ask would be, if you found this episode valuable, just think of one friend or colleague that you think would enjoy the content and just, just please share. So thanks again. We'll see you next time. Travis York is the owner of 3-in-1 Vet Advisors and a partner of Signature FD. 3-in-1 Vet Advisors is a veterinary consulting and strategic planning firm of which Signature FD has no involvement or ownership. James Yost is a partner and wealth advisor at Signature FD. Signature FD is an investment advisor registered with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. 3-in-1 Vet Advisors and Signature FD are not affiliated. Mr. York provides all non-investment advisory services through 3-in-1 Vet Advisors. The opinions of the guests and the contents of this podcast are intended to be educational only and should not be relied upon as investment, tax, business, or planning advice. You should consult with a professional advisor prior to taking any course of action that may impact you or your business.